Presentation under 10 minutes. They may have two minutes as rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they are representing an organization or group and they can then have five minutes. Uh, pursuant to the provision of Section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County via a statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure Sure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Um, first, we do the historic the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Um. Ladies and gentlemen, there was one item that has been pulled from consent, uh, actually not for to be heard at another month, uh, so leaving five. Uh, on the consent agenda, 2006 Beechwood Avenue, an application to demolish an outbuilding and construct a new outbuilding with setback determination. 1607 Linden Avenue, uh, construction of an addition. Uh, 245 Lauderdale is the one that's been pulled. 2813 Ackland Avenue, an application for new construction and addition and outbuilding with setback determination. 912 Chickamauga Avenue, <clears throat> application for new construction of an addition. And 1415 Forest Avenue, application of new construction of an outbuilding. Staff has reviewed these applications, find that they meet their respective design guidelines, and recommends approval of them as a consent agenda. Thank you very much. Any questions uh, regarding staff, regarding anything on the consent agenda? Okay. Thank you, Sean. Um, before I close consent agenda, does anyone in the public have anything we need to bring off on the consent agenda? Okay. I hereby close public hearing. Uh, Motion to approve the consent agenda? Okay, second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Consent agenda is approved. Okay. The first order of new business, 1719 Fifth Avenue South. We've actually gone out of order just a little bit, so if you don't mind, we'll back up to the Eastwood Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Okay. This is for an expansion of an existing overlay. You may notice on the map it has sort of a, a wonky boundary right now. It doesn't really follow the actual boundaries of the neighborhood. And that was due to, at the time that it was adopted, that was due to the uh, support that they had at that time. Now there's a great deal of support from what we understand to expand those boundaries to be more in line with the actual neighborhood boundaries. The majority of the um, buildings are contributing. They are in keeping with the type of historic fabric you already see there in the existing overlay. And I believe believe that the representative of the Neighborhood Association is here, and no doubt there are some others that would like to tell you their feelings on this overlay. But we do recommend approval of a recommendation to Metro Council and of the existing design guidelines for these, the new properties if they're added. Okay, thank you. Any questions to Robin? Do, do these additions make this um, contiguous? Yes, it's all contiguous. Robert, what's the task of the board relative to approving an overlay and stuff like that? What you'll be approving is a recommendation to Metro Council, an adoption of the design guidelines that already exist, but an adoption for those to apply to the new, bound, the new uh, properties as well as existing. We have specific criteria we're supposed to mm -hmm. follow. You do, and this one applies because it's eligible for listing in the National Register, which is one of the criteria. Okay. Thanks, Robin. Thanks. Uh, open public hearing. Um, you can please come up and speak. Um, Sean will keep a timer on, just uh, five minutes, and um, we uh, encourage everyone to speak. But if you if you heard all of your stuff being spoken before, you know maybe just make a quick confirmation about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and please state your name and address. Five for the applicant. Two for subsequent okay. follow-ups. Thank you. Five for the applicant and two for the subsequent. subsequent. My name is Brett Withers and I live at 1113 Granada Avenue in the Eastwood neighborhood. 
I am currently serving in my fifth consecutive year as the president of Eastwood Neighbors. And on behalf of all of our neighbors, I would like to thank you for granting us your time and attention this afternoon. Eastwood Neighbors comes before you today to request that you support the clearly expressed will of the majority of property owners to expand our neighborhood's conservation zoning overlay to include all properties within the proposed new boundaries. It is no secret that development pressures are reshaping Nashville neighborhoods and are particularly focused on the inner core historic urban neighborhoods such as Eastwood. The benefits of the quality control measures put in place by conservation zoning overlays become more and more clear with each passing day. It is unfortunate that inappropriate and insensitive development is now destroying the very historic structures that are earning our neighborhoods national and international attention and visitors in the first place. If we do not act soon, there will be little left worth visiting. If conservation zoning overlays were not worthwhile, there would be little support for them. But Eastwood is already the second neighborhood to come before this body so far in 2014 alone, seeking an expansion, the first being Hillsborough West End. Eastwood's present uh, overly boundaries can best be described as piecemeal and as such miss the purpose of historic districting in the first place. I ask that you approve the expansion to the proposed boundaries which are consistent across block faces uh, and rectify some of those carve outs that, that exist now that make things very confusing both for homeowners and for the development community. Before I talk about our information publishing and surveying process last year, I want to point out that I've received property owner calls to expand our CZO for all five years that I've been president of Eastwood Neighbors. Recent events may have raised the volume of those calls, but this expansion is by no means limited to recent opposition to umbilical cord duplexes, controversial as they may be. Rather, the simmering support for expansion of our CZO over the past several years has been rising monthly over the last two years, but for a period of that time, the Metro Historic Commission was too short-staffed to accept any expansions other than a very small one on Eastland Avenue. So our board members attended last year's Metro Council budget hearings to support the addition of Metro Historic staff so that our neighborhoods and others like ours could have a full discussion about which areas in our neighborhood really would or really would not support an expansion of our overlay. Eastwood held our first information session on Tuesday, December 10th. We advertised this meeting through our newsletter, which is delivered to each residence, as well as through our blog, Facebook page, and other social media. In addition, we placed yellow flyers on at least many of the doors of properties that were outside the present boundaries to kind of get the attention of those property owners that a really important decision is coming up that they might want to take part in. Our survey process uh, of property owners kicked off that night on December the 10th, as well as door-to-door -door canvassing that began, and that uh, continued through December. At the end of December, we actually had majority property owner support, but many property owners let us know that they wanted more time and perhaps more information. So we continued door-to-door -door canvassing, providing uh, information as well as a survey form to property owners, and we scheduled a second information session on January the 27th. And in fact, uh, again, getting back to the, the heightened uh, tensions around this issue, one of the neighbors, uh, not part of our board or anything like that, called the news about an inappropriate uh, demolition that was taking place, and WSMV Channel 4 News advertised to all of Nashville that folks need to get their surveys into us. The final survey results were collated and analyzed for Councilman Westerholm's edification. Uh, the percentage of property owner support expressed was overwhelming. Uh, it was clear. Certainly some property owners were opposed, and some of those property owners are here today, and they're going to express their opinions, and those opinions are as valid as anyone else's. But what I would like to submit to the, the this body is that Council and Westerholm has already taken a lot of those uh, opinions into consideration in reviewing the surveys and putting together the, map, the expansion map that we have. There are uh, There is at least one block where property owners were not uh, in support and were left out. There's an additional block where there was little property owner support and only one historic structure in that block was left out. We had two blocks where neighbors actually wrote in and did write-in campaigns wanting to be added. Um, so those uh, that is the process by which the boundaries that you are reviewing today were set by Councilman Westerholm looking at the survey results of our neighbors. So in summary, I asked the commissioners to approve Eastwood Neighbors Conservation Zoning Expansion request to include all properties in, in the proposed boundaries. Our survey process was fair and well advertised and reflects the will of the majority of our neighbors. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.
My name is John Harris. I've resided at 2023 Benjamin Street since 1988. In that, when I moved in more than 25 years ago, there were still residents that had been there since the teens and 20s. And living with these elderly folks at that time was quite a pleasure. There are still neighbors on my block of Benjamin Street that have been there since the 60s. The in my opinion, regardless of what my predecessor said, it is my opinion that owner-occupied opinions are more relevant than absentee landlord opinions in terms of whether the property should be expanded or not, uh, the, the overlay should be expanded or not. I am fully in favor of it. Uh, I think the historic nature of our neighborhood should be sustained. I do not mind the commercial development on the commercial streets. I think they look great. There are places that the replacement property is significantly better than what was there before. The, the, the condos uh, replacing the dry cleaners at the corner of Scott and Eastland, for example. The uh, Mexican restaurant, uh, Rose Pepper Cantina, that replaced the old grocery store slash video shop that was there in the 70s and 80s. So I wish to stand for you and ask you to approve this expansion and protect our historic nature. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Lanier Brandau. I'm here with my brother, Alexander Brandau. We both grew up at 822 Porter Road. Uh, Alexander owns property at 2002 Benjamin. I have a, a property at 2009 Tillman. And we're also here on behalf of our mother and grandfather, JoLynn Colley and John Colley, who own numerous properties in East Nashville and have lived there and cared for them for over 100 years. Um, I'm here specifically regarding the properties um, that are going to be affected by this over I have some handouts for you that show our different properties that we um, own and manage on the east and west sides of Porter Road. Um, and we are here talking about 830 Porter Road, 828 Porter Road, 822, 824, the lot, 814 and 816 lot. Um, we have also spoken with our neighborhood association and Council Westerholm. We understand the concerns of our neighbors and the need for this historic overlay, um, but we see that it's in direct conflict with messages we've received from our neighborhood association and other constituents that the development from Eastland and Porter Road is going to continue down Porter Road. Um, our properties are in between Eastland and Benjamin. Um, and we're just confused because the while we've getting messages that the um, development needs to continue, it's our opinion that the overlay is going to drastically impact what can be done with the properties that we own. Um, we are very community minded. Most of the houses that we own are, are occupied by um, our tenants and our neighbors that have been in this community forever. Um, we are in the very beginning stages of thinking about an SP for this neighborhood in which we will certainly involve our neighbors. Um, but we are not in favor of the overlay on these properties. And we expressed that to our neighborhood association and Councilman Westerholm. And uh, while we see that it's valid for much of the neighborhood, we really think it's gonna cause problems for all of us down the road when we come back in a couple of months and That's say, time. hey, here's our plan. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Shannon Poindexter. I live at 1413 Benjamin Street. I've been a resident there since 2002. I'm in support of this overlay and specifically the reasons why. I'm not, I do not object to new construction. What I object to is the types of construction that are going up in the neighborhood where two years ago I could walk around the neighborhood with my dog and enjoy people's beautiful yards and gorgeous trees and lovely homes. And what I'm seeing now are dozens of umbilical cord duplexes, houses that are not in the right style or the right size. If the scale or the size of new construction fits the neighborhood and you don't feel like you're getting slapped in the face when you walk by it, it should not be a problem. But what I'm seeing in my neighborhood over the last couple of years is that the developers are not being mindful of the size or the scale or the style, and they're missing on all accounts, and it is destroying 
the nature and the personality of our neighborhoods. I would please ask that you approve this recommendation for an overlay expansion in Eastwood Neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Rick Punkashar. I've got a property on 818 Porter, sandwiched in. And uh, I'm definitely in the, in the, in the squeeze of the, of the empire. And then I have a, 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 a lot that backs up on Gentry that looks at Tillman, uh, looks at Fall Street. And all I'm looking for is some uh, architectural design integrity to the neighborhood. Uh, like was expressed, the types of properties being constructed going as high as possible, going as deep as possible, going as wide as possible with virtually no consideration of architectural um, integrity to the surrounding properties makes a very funky neighborhood, very tasteless. And, um, and also, I'm fairly certain uh, that an SP request relative to commercial de development down Porter could be a separate issue, uh, would not have to constrain uh, a, an overlay because I, I'm not aware of a, a, of a drive down Porter for commercial, although I can see it in the future. But I think that that even would provide integrity to that development as well to have some architectural uh, standards in place, as modest as they are in an overlay. This is not a historic district, this is an overlay. And I would like to see some amount of integrity to preserve the existing neighborhoods. And even if it went commercial, that would still give some integrity to the neighborhoods. Thank you. I'm in favor of the overlay. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Sherry Beard and this is Richard Quinn and we own and live at 1919 Eastland Avenue which was recently added to a smaller overlay expansion and borders the proposed expense extension. We love our neighborhood of older homes. They're very distinctive. We do live in new infield, compatible with the neighborhood. We're strong supporters of new development which provides more options for new residents. A small number of the neighborhood homes are non-contributing and those, that are, those lots are prime locations for new construction. We also support SP as long as it confirms to the overlay. SP has worked in our neighborhood before. The existing overlay has encouraged quality development and helped rejuvenate our neighborhood. Unfortunately, much of the recent construction outside the current overlay has been totally out of scale and inappropriate and it threatens all of our property values. We urge you to approve, along with many of our neighbors, Eastwood Neighbors proper, uh, Conservation Overlay Extension to protect our neighborhood character and to encourage the right kind of development. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? My name is Nathan Tasker. I live at 810 Porter Road, two doors down from Rick. And in between us is, uh, he suggested the Empire. That's where I live, next door to that. Um, I'm for the overlay. Uh, my wife and I have lived and own our house for the last seven years. I've loved being in East Nashville. Love the character. One of the reasons we moved there. It disappoints us as we walk around to see what seems to be capitalization and exploitation of our area. Uh, simply developers being able to come in with no regard for what's already currently in existence. We'd love to see the shift to high density urban core. We're all for that. We come from Sydney, Australia, which is exactly that. However, in keeping with what's already there for the people that are current residents, whilst also looking forward to those that will move into the area and appreciate an area, area still full of character rather than having had that character detracted. So I'm for the overlay and I urge you to consider approving that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, my name is Vicki Jones. I live at 204 Manchester Avenue. I am for the overlay. Um, 
I've lived there since 2000. And I, single female, moved in, scared. <laughs> There's a lot of crime in East Nashville. Um, but because of the neighbors and working with the police and um, fixing up our houses, putting a lot of money into our historic homes, caring for them, and working with the police, um, we've done... Um, it's been a lot of hard work, and I would hate to see all of that hard work uh, go by the wayside for some of the developers who are putting up these duplexes. So um, I, I'm not against new construction. I just wish that they would respect the residents who have worked really hard and put a lot of money into the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alan Hayes. I'm a resident of Eastwood Neighbors. I sit on the board with Brett. I live at uh, 1011 North 16th Street, which is actually a property that's currently within the existing boundaries of the overlay, and uh, I help uh, with the efforts to get it extended to that level where it is right now. And I want to commend everybody who's worked on it to this point. Um, also, before I sit down, I want to have everybody ask everybody who's in support today. There's a lot of people that aren't going to get up and talk, but would like to have them stand if that would be okay with you guys. Uh, I really just want to reiterate, uh, not repeat, um, but just say that the, the overlay, you know, I helped extend it before I even added on to my own house. So I've been through the process of review with, with the commission, with the with staff, and it's a, it's a great process. And as an architect, I'm an architect here in town with Thomas Miller and Partners. Um, I really appreciate what it does. And I know it puts additional constraints on new construction, but it doesn't prohibit it in any way. It really just puts a check in place, which you've heard a lot of folks talk about you know, development that's really not sensitive to a lot that we have going on. Um, I, I I emailed comments in, but just to repeat uh, those briefly, I'm really concerned about housing stock and the, the variety of housing stock in our, our East, East Nashville neighborhoods. So we were seeing a lot of the smaller homes get torn down in favor of larger and larger homes. So people that could afford to move in and, and rent a thousand dollars, buy, buy a thousand square foot house, 1200 square foot house, you're not seeing those anymore. You're seeing the smaller ones being torn down in, in favor of 2,400 or 3,000 square foot of homes. Uh, and a lot of this is just in response to what we've seen recently, but, but to Brett's credit, we've received a request to extend the overlay multiple times over the past year. So with that, I'll close out my comments, but I, I would like to ask everybody who's here today to stand that's in favor of the Eastwood overlay. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Can we ask uh, everyone who's not in favor to stand? It's just the two. <laughs> I'll do it. Our commissioner has also asked that the, whoever is not in favor, if you'd like to stand as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to close public hearing now. Appreciate you guys all coming out um, for and against. That's great. Uh, comments? Discussion? Question. Robin, uh, um, one of the applicants mentioned an SP zone. Is that, can you get an SP zoning in, in, a, in a historic overlay? There are SPs in historic overlays. They're all so completely different. There's no way to say what would be, which one would be appropriate and which one wouldn't, because they're all based on the specific project and the specific property. But they certainly can go together. Robin, can your um, staff, in fact, handle this extra load? I know that's been an issue in the past. We're scared, but yes, we can handle it. Thank you, guys. Any other comments or a motion? Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Just for the record, I'd like to say that you received a lot of public comment via email, and that was forwarded to you yesterday. And that comment that you received today was put before you in a hard copy. And the council members' letter is there before you in hard copy, too. 
I also just want to take a second to thank the neighborhood. They put in all the work to make this happen. They're the ones that go door to door, talk to people, inform people, and and pay for it. And they do an awful lot to make these happen. So very impressed with the neighborhood. Okay. This is a project that you saw last, uh, so I say last year, last month, and it is a violation at 17.9 Fifth Avenue North. It was a little more complicated last time because it had included um, demolition of a garage and several other changes. Most of those changes we were able to approve administratively. So all that they're really asking for today is approval of this change in the roof form, which also changes the porch roof form. This is what's considered a front addition, which to my knowledge you've never ever allowed. And um, it also raises the height of the building, changes the form, changes the porch form, and dramatically changes the look of the historic building. So our recommendation is disapproval of the alteration of the primary entrance dimensions and the front addition based on the fact that it does not meet sections 5B1, 2B1E, and 2A and F, and further recommend reconstruction of the original roof and porch roof forms. And I believe the applicant is here. Yes, there he is, if you have any questions again. Hey, Robin, on the um, front addition, is that the extension of the, I guess, second floor, or, or is that what that is, just a bump if out there? If you see the part, it's hard to see in this light. You may see it better on your screen. The part that kind of looks yellow, that's the raw wood. So you can see it raises the height of the house, and it changes the roof form as well, and it changes the porch form. So the one on the left is how it looked before, and the right is how it looks now. And there's another view here. Also, I'm sorry, I missed last month. So this was something that had had been partly approved, and this was done? No, this was uh, work done without a preservation permit. Okay. And received a building permit for interior work. And, but continued working, as sometimes happens, and um, so we're just asking that it be corrected. Okay, thank you. Okay, would the applicant would like to come forward and name and address? Um, I'm Derek Hovell. I am the owner of 1719 Fifth Ave. I think I met almost all of you except for you two gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> I guess to, to start off um, where we left it off last, Time. I'm not sure how much you two have been filled in on last month's, but um, I was instructed to go find out who the gentleman was that issued me my initial building permit. So whenever I did the work <clears throat> on the house, I went to the zoning department and applied for a building permit, um, told them the changes that I was looking to make on the house, and asked them what all I needed. Um, I was instructed that this was the only building permit that I needed. Um, that would be covered as long as I didn't change the footprint of the house. And I said, all right, that's great. So then completed all of the work. I had my roofer obviously roof it all in. Um, I finished everything except for the gutters and very small. Basically, the, the structure, everything is all completed. Um, and then a month later, after I completed it, that was whenever I received a stop work order. Um, and the stop work order says that it was due to work that I did outside of the scope of my initial building permit. Um, <clears throat> so then I went to, I found out that his name was Mike Kyle, who had initially helped me with my building permit. Um, he is no longer with um, with the historic, or I'm sorry, the coding, codes and zoning department, and he is retired. So I spoke with Bill Herbert, and then he also, um, I guess, John Michaels, he instructed me to have John help explain um, what he had told to him, but from, from my understanding it was the building permit that I was issued, all of the work that I've completed, they said that it was within my building permit. Um, I know that, um, Aaron, uh, you had mentioned that last time, and I think Richard, you as well, um, whenever I was build, or applying for the building permit, you were surprised that it says um, rehab of interior single family home, remain single family home, no second kitchen, no change to footprint. Um, and I haven't, I haven't done anything outside of that. Um, John, would you like to comment on anything? If the members of the board would like to have any input on that. Uh, I actually spoke with folks from Codes and Zoning because after the last meeting, I know there had been some question about you know, the interpretation of the particulars of the permit, namely the language involving interior only or whatever the 
whatever that key phrasing was, effectively pointing to the interior as the nature of the building permit. The clarification that I got from the zoning administrator, Mr. Herbert, was basically that if this property was not located in a historic overlay of some sort, that they, meaning the codes department, would not have issued a stop work order on their own. So that applies to you and it doesn't. Hopefully it helps narrow the scope of your consideration, if nothing else. But what to take away from that, I think, is that um, codes would have been less concerned about the interpretation of interior repair with regard to the nature of this construction project that was carried out by the property owner. But instead, the fact that it's in the overlay is kind of what brings you into the discussion. And as counsel to you, I will note for you that is the main thing you have to be looking at right now is, does this meet the guidelines? Uh, and if no, what to do about it? And just just one sideline for me, I think I think almost the previous topic that everyone was just discussing is a good segue into what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not trying to demolish the house and build up two large duplex things. I'm making a, an altar to a home that's that's the second bedroom of a two bedroom home, so you guys can put whatever value you feel on that. Um, basically, if I had to remove that, my two bedroom, two bath house is now a one bedroom, two bath house. So um, that's a, a major value um, hindrance on me if I had to remove that. And forgive me for just one little piece of catch up from last month. Mm -hmm. So basically on the, your, um, your application, <coughs> they did not indicate that it was in a historic overlay? It says um, CA overlay, I believe, or CA conservation. Um, I was not instructed what that meant, anything like that. Whenever I went to the historic website, it said that I needed to go to a map to see if I was on in the historic conservation area. And I clicked the historic layer, and I did not see my home on that map. Um, and it, I guess, the, does that answer your question? It does. Yeah, okay. thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions to the applicant? I guess most of you are pretty familiar with it from last one. Okay. I've got, I've got some updated photos, too, of the place, if you if you guys would be interested in. I'm not sure how many you need, but it should be enough, I think. And then. Um, so just so one more, one other thing that I want to clear up. I know last time we were talking about the house next door, and that was part of the plans that you all had. I guess it was on the, the January um, docket, or however you want to refer to this. Um, and the house to the right of me was approved for the new, constru new construction. And I think as far as just looking at it from the grand scheme of things, scale, um, I think that my... My dormer that I added is a is a good example of you guys needing to, or an opportunity for you guys to grant a variance opposed to um, asking me to remove that. Okay. Don't, don't take this as any means of how I'm going to vote or what I think about it. But would you consider? changing the size of that dormer. I've, I've told you guys I'm wide open to as many ideas. I'm, I'm open to working with you. Yeah, I, okay. I can I can do anything as long as it's me working with you guys. I, I would be open to that. Yeah, I've said that since day one. And so, Derek, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, I do remember some of the notes from last last uh, meeting as well <clears throat> and I think where I got a little clearer about where your presentation from last one is that it was really clear that on your permit <clears throat> it did say a conservation overlay now maybe there was some whatever miscommunication she had with zoning but um, 
it's just really clear that there's guidelines to that conservation overlay. Um, so <laughs> that, that's that's where our purview as a board is, is that for us to look at those guidelines mm -hmm. and whether your um, structure might, what looks c contextual to that neighborhood, um, our purview is to follow those guidelines. And <clears throat> if you have worked with, and the question that Richard has asked, whether you would consider the uh, changing of the dormer, we you've probably worked with staff, right? And has staff given you any any other options to within the guidelines? No, my I was instructed that I had two options. My first option was to comply. And she said that that means basically tear it all off. Or my second option was to come in front of you all because I, I don't knock the historic department for bringing this to your guys' attention, but I think that the purpose of coming in front of you all is so you, whenever you see an extenuating circumstance of looking at why it would be outside of those guidelines. I think 99% of the time, your purpose is to be here and um, I think make sure that people aren't building things that are outside of why there's an overlay. Um, and then that random one-off time, which I think is this, this example, is whenever you grant a variance and it's someone tr just trying to make the neighborhood better and I'm not tearing down the house, building a duplex, I'm just adding a second bedroom. Uh, my name mentions a great point. On your building permit, it did say that you were, it was in the conservation district. I can, is that correct? I mean, what? I've heard your defense on the codes, and I've heard your defense on the... So, um, underneath, if you look at the general page, it's way down at the bottom after, it says zoning assignments R6 OVUZ0 OVNHC, which is neighborhood conservation overlay. I, I was never instructed whenever I was getting the building permit, I specifically asked, is this the only permit I've, I need? Am I covered? I, I was trying to do all my homework and I was instructed that that was the only permit that I needed. And then after completing all the work, that was whenever it was brought to my attention. But does it not say, it's not just the abbreviations, doesn't it also say neighborhood conservation overlay? Those, Correct. those words, yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yes, I'm sorry, did I interrupt somebody? Go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to make sure what you're saying, John, about the conversation with Bill Herbert. Could you clarify that for me, please? Sure. Um, the point of the discussion was to attempt to narrow the scope of the commission's review today. I think at the previous meeting there may have been some concern about exactly what role um, the building permit, what role codes would have played with regard to interpreting the building permit. If this was not in a historic overlay, would there have been a stop work order based upon the interpretation of the interior versus some other type of permit? Uh, they clarify that no codes would not have issued a stop work order on that. So to the extent the commission had, had questions or concerns about, wait a second, before we even get into the determination of whether this fits the guidelines, this shouldn't have happened at all, which seemed to be some of the concern last time. We can at least close that off because if it was not in a historic historic overlay of some sort, then codes would not said that they would not have issued a stop work order. So with that conversation then, uh, or that clarification given from the folks at codes, Mr. Herbert in particular, I think that puts it back to the commission to say, fine, we then look at the historic part, the overlay, and try to figure out how that fits into the guideline, which is of course your charge to interpret and apply appropriately. And just go on, read it I just wanted to get that clarified because in my mind as one commissioner on this board here, um, that really does put it right in the heart of the conservation overlay for your home mm -hmm. and leaves us very narrow um, interpretation here. Um, because there are guidelines that we must follow. I agree. And, um, and that's just the deal. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I know I was one that's told you to go and find him. Mm -hmm. 
find the, uh, the guy that issued you the permit. Yeah. And he was retired. Yes, ma'am. And so you've tried to do that, and now we've got legal counsel in here telling us what the result of that inquiry by you led to. Mm -hmm. So that puts us right back here mm -hmm. in the middle of the historic overlay mm -hmm. uh, applicable to your your home. Mm -hmm. That's the situation we're dealing with here. Correct. And I, I think as far as the purpose of me coming before you and presenting this whole thing, it's so you guys can understand how much of a financial hardship it would be on me should you ask me to remove all that. I um, To give you two a little bit more background, I did all the work myself. January is slow time for my business now it's getting ramped up and I wouldn't be able to remote remove all that myself um, I would have to contract it out and spend probably four times what I did on it originally just putting it up there um, so that's a major financial request for me to remove something like that um, and I, I know I, I don't have the money to do it so I'm curious how this wall will get taken care of did you have another comment, Aaron? No, oh, okay. 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 Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, open public hearing. Anyone like to speak uh, regarding this project? I'm sorry. Do I need to approach? Ah, yep. Just for the record, and just Alan, just give your address and everything again. Uh, my name is Alan Hayes. I live at 1011 North 16th Street in the Eastwood neighborhood. Um, I just wanted to, and maybe it's been said, and I've only been hearing what's been said today, but is it a contributing structure or is it not contributing to the current overlay? It is contributing. Okay, that makes it tough. Um, I, I know when I went through this process with my house, it was a non-contributing structure, so there was a lot more leeway. Um, here, you know, again, I see the roof line and, and, and the dormer are the, are the primary concerns, and so I just wanted to understand that a little bit better. So. That, that makes it tough, so thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, well, let me make sure we have no more people Yeah. My name is Brett Withers. <clears throat> Pardon me again. I live at 1113 Granada Avenue. Um, our guidelines are pretty clear uh, in my conversations that we've had with our neighborhood. They may be a little bit different with Salem Town, I'm not sure. Uh, again, when we went in educating homeowners about whether or not they thought the overlay would benefit them, we did put pros and cons. Um, some of the cons were that it adds another layer of government oversight over your project, which is fundamentally uh, anathema to some people. Uh, but another one of the cons is that you cannot enclose a front porch or add a front dormer. That's a very clear guideline, at least in our, in our neighborhood. I'd, I'd be curious to know what it is in Salem Town. That's a pretty clear guideline. And so, uh, from my perspective, if you start allowing people to add front dormers to properties, you're going to have uh, a chain effect of everyone wanting to add front dormers to properties. And I totally, I'm working on my old house, and I understand where you're coming from. I can't see a reason why, had he perhaps consulted the staff in the first place, he could have made a similar addition to the rear of the property, where there's a lot more leeway, and he could have gained the square footage. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jason Feller. I reside at 1115 Douglas Avenue, uh, Eastwood Neighbors. Uh, I'm not in favor of that overlay. But as far as this gentleman's house is concerned, I, I understand. Uh, I understand all of that. Um, but front dormers are not uncommon in houses, uh, and in historic houses particularly. And I can understand, I mean, I don't know where your thinking was going, uh, Mr. Fletcher, but I can understand uh, designing houses myself, I can understand that maybe the scale of the dormer and some of the things kind of don't fit. But uh, I guess what I'm saying is to give him two options, either to remove it all or beg for your mercy is it, it, that's that that seems that seems pretty rough that I think there's there's room with what's there maybe to work with that's all thank you client comes I mean for the um, owner comes back up or 
I mean, just for clarification, Robin, the, the front dormer, can you just speak to that? Yes, the issue really isn't the front dormer itself. It's that the addition changes right. the roof shape and height. The dormer's just another piece to it. But if it were the dormer alone, uh, you know, I'm not sure where we'd be. But it's that change in the roof shape right. and height that's very clear in the guidelines. Robin, real quick. Excuse me. The, um, the change in the height, does it, ex I mean, it, it does exceed the height guideline, or is it, is it, we're talking about the fact that it just changes, or does it go above? Because looking at the pictures of the two neighbors, mm -hmm. they're quite this, high. If this were new construction, we'd definitely be looking at the context, but this is a historic building. So we're looking at not just what's appropriate for the neighborhood, but what's appropriate for this historic building. And to alter the height and the roof form is not appropriate according to the design guidelines. Okay. So that was one thing that I'd mentioned last time was <clears throat> whether it was contributing or non-contributing, um, I know that mason work is not included or is, is not historically accurate for that time. Um, Robin has asked me to change the front windows. She said that all of the windows have been altered. Um, at all four sides of the house have been significantly altered. Um, the, I believe the previous photo, if you could click back one slide. Um, that large um, monstrosity of a garage is a, an aluminum garage that's glued onto the back of the house. Um, I'm looking to do away with all that. I'm trying to make it better and greater good kind of methodology. Um, and I understand where you're coming from. The, the additional height is one foot eight inches. I added. It's not like I was adding four stories to it. Um, I would I would understand where you guys are coming from. Okay. So. All right. Thank you very much. Um, if we have other questions, we'll call you back. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I think I've closed public hearing. Um, discussion. Uh, just, sorry. Go ahead. Just clarification. Um, Robin, the um, garage that's we did approve demolition of that. We approved it administratively. Yes. So I just wanted to clarify that for... Well, I, I think from what we heard last month and what, we're, what we've heard today, uh, and specifically what John Michael said, um, I think I know where we are, and it's that this wouldn't be approved if it had come through on a normal application. I think most folks are in agreement with that. So then we're left with, now what do we do? There's clearly a very big hardship. Um, but we've got guidelines, and we also have precedent. And it's it's my understanding, and Robin, please correct me if I'm wrong, that we um, have forced applicants in the past in similar situations to either modify the alterations to comply with the guidelines or tear them out. And in certain cases, the modifications were much bigger than what we're looking at today. Is that a fair statement? That's fair. And we don't have examples of where we've said, wow, that was a big mistake. Um, and DVA from the guidelines went in, in a clear situation of something that doesn't comply. Is that fair to say? So, with that in mind, I mean, I think it's a really tough situation, but um, the permit was clear. In my mind, it said neighborhood conservation overlay, and it, it sounds like the applicant got some bad information or misunderstood what he was being told or maybe didn't describe his project as well as he needed to. Who knows? I mean, who knows what actually happened there? Um, but we have precedent, and I think this the the hardship here is that it was a self permit. If the applicant had a contractor or an architect, he'd have somebody could go back on and get recourse. But I think this is sort of the risk that goes with having a self permit. That you assume a lot of risk, and you assume that you'll be able to read the permit correctly and find read the maps on the website correctly, because there, there's no question the overlay was posted and the map was correct. He just looked in the wrong spot. Um, so for me, it's it's a really unfortunate situation, but I don't think we have a choice other than to enforce the guidelines and um, 
follow staff's recommendation to uh, enforce the violation. I agree with that. Um, what I it is very tough. There's no question about that. To the gentleman from Eastland, who uh, nailed it with that observation, it was tough the last time, and I was trying to find something to help this property owner and help us because to me this is a kind of a case of first impression uh, for us. Um, so if we could find out what the idea of the uh, codes administration was in giving this um, building permit, maybe we could find something to, to help all of us in this tough situation. But in fact, what we've heard Mr. Michael say, is it Michael? <laughs> um, actually reinforces that it puts it right back into our our bailiwick and we have to deal with that and our guidelines and unfortunately that makes this a case that we have to we must follow the staff I think on this any discussion or a motion more discussion or a motion I should say even though I wasn't here for the last month's meeting even though um, the applicant should have um, known about the guidelines, um, you know, all of that. Here we are. The, the damage is done. And although he clearly did not follow the roof guideline, he also did not break it to such a gross degree that I'm sitting here looking at the two neighbors and um, with his hardship, I mean, if he would have done something really far out, I would have a very different opinion. Um, I don't feel like we're changing precedent if we grant this hardship in this situation. We could obviously still talk about the dormer, but um, I believe he said, what, a foot and eight inches, something like that. Um, I would be inclined um, to, um, to grant this. Yeah, I, but I think the, the point on the roof is not really necessarily the height. It's that there's an addition that came out in the front, which I, you know, evidently we've never done before. So it's not necessarily the, you know, what the, what the new peak of the roof has become. It's just that he has built over that roof or built over that porch, which is like a very rare thing. Could we see the slide of the the home again? It's, it's not just a, a ridge raise. It's it's completely altering the roof form. It's it's just it's not something that's been approved or would be approved. And I, I think it's it's not just breaking that precedent. It's it's the whole notion that the guidelines have to be complied with, and we don't really have a choice. It's it's not. I think we would not be following the guidelines if we approve it, and that's the way that we've done it in the past on a number of occasions with hardships apparently much bigger than this. It's a, it's a, like Rose said, it's an issue of first impression for some of us, but for this commission as a whole and its history, I don't think they've broken that precedent, and I'm not willing to start with that. I think it's a really, really slippery slope for people to start talking about mistakes. Okay, everyone's discussed. Okay. Is there a motion? I'll uh, move to uh, move in accordance with staff's recommendation to uh, just, just I guess to 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 cause the uh, to enforce the stop work order and to cause the applicant to undo the changes that he's made and restore the uh, the roof and porch 
in any other affected areas outside the guidelines, restore them to their condition prior to the commencement of his work. Okay, we have a motion. And Mr. Chairman, with that motion having been seconded, I think legal should note uh, that the commission does have the authority to grant um, an expansive timeline for correction if in fact that should be the commission's pleasure uh, in light of the fact that there seems to be some interest in trying to make this as somewhat reasonable as possible. That is one variable that you can bring into play. Thank you for pointing that out. Robin, what, what, what have been the timelines in the past? They varied greatly based on the work. Um, building permits are usually good for I mean, I'm, I'm just pulling a number off the top of my head, maybe three months. I mean, that should be more than enough time to pull that off. shouldn't take more than a day, really. But, you know, in light of giving him some extra time to get it done. Yeah, I think it's, I think for, it sounds like from him, though, it's the monetary issue, not the, can you send five people out there and tear it off? Um, six months. Six months sounds yeah. pretty reasonable to me. If, People have other ideas. Yeah. With with that in mind, then I'd like to revise my motion to include that the uh, the restoration period be up to six months. Okay. Okay. We have a motion, an amended motion, and it has been properly seconded. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Okay, the next project is 101 Broadway. Okay. 101 Broadway is an application for new signage at the Acme building. The applicant proposes a new projecting sign on the right of the slide on the front facade, a painted sign on the east facade facing First Avenue on the left of the slide. The proposed signs meet guidelines for design, lighting, and allocation of sign area. The painted Acme sign is proposed to be approximately 200 square feet. Although design guidelines state that a painted sign should not be more than 125 square feet, staff finds this sign appropriate as this is a large building with two large exposed facades and recommends its approval as submitted. The projecting sign in its current location does not meet guidelines that projecting signs be located below the third story window sills. Staff requests that the location of this sign be moved below the third story window sills. The applicant proposes to restore two historic murals at the rear of the building in the dotted lines at the corners for the Beard and Buggy Company, which occupied the building from 1913 to 1924. The restoration of the historic signs meets design guidelines. The project includes replacing a cornice above the front entrance that has been removed previously. The proposed detailing is appropriate to the historic dental molding that can be seen above the, um, the first floor, uh, the front door there. With the condition that staff approve its material, replacement of the cornice meets guidelines. Staff recommends approval of the proposed signage with staff approval of the cornice material and the condition that the projecting sign be moved below the window sills of the third story in accordance with guidelines. And I think the applicant is here to address the, uh, the location of the projecting sign. Okay. Any questions, Paul? Paul, in the, um, your recommendation for the large sign, um, are you comfortable that's not going to set some precedent or anything in the future for other buildings to ask for larger signs? This facade of the is unusually large compared to other storefronts, sir. Um, Robin, do you have anything to add on that? No, he's, he's absolutely correct. This is a corner building, so you see a lot more of the building than you do most every other building in the district. And it is a very long, wide facade. So in this case, we thought that a little extra would be fine. And it, you can't really see it in any of the photographs because it's so faint. But there used to be a painted sign on the opposite end of this side that was probably even a little bit bigger than this one, which was another reason we thought this size was appropriate for the painted sign. Okay, thank you. Great. 
All right, if the owner or applicant would like to come forward, say your name and address. Hi, my name is Kristen Walker, uh, 101 Broadway. I'm the project manager for uh, this venue. Um, I did bring a slideshow here. Um, this is in reference to the recommendation that the projecting sign be placed below the third floor window sill. Um, you get the first slide. Oh, do, I do. I haven't done a pre okay. presentation since college, so. <laughs> <laughs> you can just um, move forward. Right. Thank you. My first PowerPoint. Um, this is the elevation of Broadway. Um, as you can see, our location on lower Broadway positions us at a disadvantage uh, for visibility of our signage from the busier parts of Broadway. This illustration here shows the line of sight from 5th and Broadway. The red line represents the elevation of the very top of the sign if it were allowed to be placed as requested. As you can see, that's at or below um, the other signage on Broadway. Red button. There we go. Um, here are some examples of other signage uh, that are outside of the third floor restriction, most of which are in the first and second and Broadway corridor. It is also important to note that the ACME will be occupying all levels of the building, including the rooftop. Um, so there you have the Paradise Park sign. Um, Cotton Eye Joe has two of them, uh, Trail West, and then the Hard Rock, which is directly across the street from us. They have the, um, it's not a projecting sign, but it is there at the t uh, neon sign at the top of the building. Um, lastly, the signage placement will avoid obstruction of some of the historical elements that we will be preserving. Um, as you can see from this picture, the placement of the signage fits best within the blank space above the third floor windowsill. The proposed attachment to the building would be within this white space, and the tops of the sign would stop below the existing architectural elements above, so we wouldn't be going through any of the, um, the checkered areas uh, when we attach the sign. That's all I have. Okay, any questions to the applicant? So you agree with everything else, it's just you like to... The, your discussion is strictly just the um, third, the placement of that. Um, the placement sign. of the sign on okay, the building. The yes, it, we're within all the other guidelines and, and okay. Okay. Um, yeah, just the placement there. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, open public hearing. Um, anybody would like to speak um, on regarding this project? Please come forward. And My name's Alan Hayes from uh, 1011 North 16th. Sorry, I don't get to come to these much. This is fun. Um, the uh, the cornice material was mentioned. I didn't hear what it what it was proposed to be. I know there's been some buildings downtown where the cornice has been original and then it's gone, been gone back and replaced with plywood in some cases or sometimes EFIS material stucco. So I just wanted to hear an elaboration on what was there now and what was proposed to be put back in its place and I guess a little bit of the reason why. So, the, the molding actually isn't there right now, but it does show up in earlier photographs that uh, Mr. Hoffman showed you. They haven't decided on the material yet. That's one of the conditions is that they'll come back to us later and, and let us know what the material will be. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> okay, if there's no one else, I'll close public hearing. Robin, what is the, the reason for the rule that the projecting sign be below the third windowsill? Third floor windowsill? There were quite a few people that were involved <coughs> in creating these design guidelines. They're almost exactly the same as what they are for the DTC, the downtown area. And that included signage companies and property owners, realtors, um, codes, planning, MDHA. It included a lot of different people. So I can't tell you exactly what the thinking was, but I believe the idea was to keep signage at a reasonable height and size. And that has been our concern with making any recommendations for you that go beyond what is clearly stated as could be a modification. There are several places in the guidelines that say this should happen this way, but you may be able to do that with a modification from the commission. So unless it has said something like that, like with a painted sign, we've been really leery about recommending any alterations because so many people were involved in creating these and have put a lot of time and work into doing this. 
So the signs that that were shown before that that go above that third mm -hmm. floor sill. They were before. Before. Before these current design guidelines. Have we approved any um, above the third floor sill? Not with these design guidelines. I, th I think what I heard the applicant also say was that it was a visual concern that it, because of the building. I think that's correct. Is that right? So, you know, a lot of the signage that you see, and I'm, again, that's not our purview, <laughs> that particular, you know, like signage, but except for this, um, is it seems more friendly street wise to have it lower <clears throat> versus higher because you can't see it. Just. Okay. Um, any more discussion or can I motion? Would it be uh, uh, okay to ha have the applicant come back one more time and Absolutely. walk through the sign sure. thing one more time? Do you mind coming through back one more time? Sure. I, I don't mind. Okay. Come on up. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to be my next No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it appears that we really don't um, agree to lower that much, so maybe you could give us a bigger reason why we should consider it. Um, I mean, given the, the um, you know, a couple of these pictures, um, I mean, I think the obviously the fifth and Broadway area is the most popular. Uh, the lower Broadway area traditionally has seen less traffic. Um, I think the the trend is that we're revitalizing that area, and in an effort to do that, um, we as as a business would like our signage to be visible to the more popular areas to kind of extend that business all the way to the riverfront. Elevation. Yeah, so, th so th this is a picture of uh, Fifth and Broadway, and the elevation significantly drops. Um, I mean, as you can see from there, we're probably 10 to 15 feet lower uh, sitting at First and Broadway as you are at Fifth and Broadway. So in, in essence, our signage is would not be any taller than anyone's, and if you can see, the, the red line is actually from the very top of the sign. That is the 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 height that it would uh, that it could possibly go. It wouldn't go beyond that. As you can see, that line of sight there. You know, we're in the middle. The top of our sign would be in the middle of most of the signage on Broadway. It would, given the elevation of the street, yes. What was the other argument about the, um, the architectural features and? So, I mean, um, within this project, we are trying to preserve as much of the building inside and out as possible. That's why we've recommended to um, to put the, the molding back on the front of the building. Um, if we were to attach to the, the white area there, just through that brick, we wouldn't be doing any damage to the existing checkered on the side, and we'd also be below the architectural elements that are there that would be above the sign. So the top of that arrow would be the very top of the sign, and we would not be obstructing any of the architectural elements, um, which we would actually like to, to bring out as well. Some of the areas that have been painted over. Okay, let me ask that question. Maybe I'm not looking at this right, but the arrow, is, uh, the, the height of that arrow is where your sign's going to go. Correct. But it's well, the, the, the attachment to the sign. So that, that's the height of the sign. So that's giving you a visual of, of the sign if it were attached to the building. But we wouldn't be attached, if we were able to raise it, we wouldn't have to attach through the checkered area. We wouldn't have to damage that piece. We would be able to attach through just through the, the blank brick that's right there. Thank you. Is, is the checkered piece a, a different material or is that just painted on? It's a tin. 
some sort of metal. Um, but those, those, there are actually on the other side of the building some uh, pieces as well. And you are keeping that? Element? Yes, yes. We'll be keeping all of that. Any more, more discussion? Okay. All right. Thank you very much for coming back. Thanks. Okay. Any more discussion? Or um, do we I have think a the guidelines are, are pretty clear that it shall not happen. But I do think there's also extenuating circumstances. I, I, I don't know that I feel strongly whether they've been met. I'd like to hear what other people think. But there are a number of them. Um, you've got the slope. Of, of this street and the way that most of the opportunities to perceive the sign would be uphill because it's at the very end of the street. Um, it's the bookend before you get to the river. It has an unusually large and long facade. Um, <coughs> if they attach it like she's describing, there's an opportunity to not attach into an architectural element and um, further to that it's not going to damage any um, historical elements that if you lowered it you may um, I think some of that's pretty compelling but I'd like to hear what other people think what's the difference in height uh, you know what are we talking about two foot three foot versus where this is where she where she's presenting it to be I'm, I'm not sure the exact height, but I would say that I think the guidelines are about how the sign is attached or appropriate for the building as opposed to, I, we've had this issue come up before where someone wanted a sign seen from a certain location. And there isn't anything in the guidelines about your guarantee that you should be seen from somewhere, you know, wherever the location is. But it is about what's appropriate for the building and its architectural features, if that helps. Um, I was going to add to what Aaron said that um, in looking at the picture when the applicant was um, speaking, um, I'm persuaded by the elevation in the, fr in the slope of the street from 5th and Broad to 1st and Broad. And I do think it, it puts there's some hardship on this building to have its sign seen. And I'm also persuaded by the fact that there is the, the checkerboard part is made of a different material. I think that's a, a, one of the charms of this building. I know it. I've seen this building. I love it. Um, and um, and I, I, I just think I'm persuaded that uh, the placement of the sign um, in the manner in which the applicant has described it is 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 fine really i don't see any objection really to having the sign placed there I, I think that's the most compelling reason for me is that you are not going to disturb or less disturbance to an architectural feature that's the most compelling point. Visually, that that's not compelling, because you know, again, when you have a sign higher, I mean, I might be my, I might be height challenged, but <clears throat> looking at signs that that's not compelling for me. But saving an architectural feature is, and the fact that the head in balance to how other this group of people who have created this design guideline, you know, be respectful of that because they have looked at it and they know Broadway better than most. So <clears throat> Yeah, I agree the the height does not I don't feel that that's compelling either. I think that uh, you know, it's all relative to where you are on the street, but but also um saving the checkerboard could be something I'd be that definitely feel like it's worth considering. You know, it's interesting, if you look at the building on the right, they almost maintain the sill height of a third floor. Those sill heights are so much higher. I do have a question about the checkerboard, just to the applicant. Is it in good shape? Yes. Is is anything falling off? Is anything being come detached? No, it's in very good shape, and, and um, we want to keep them. 
And is it brick behind that? Do you, do you know? Okay, let's hear it. Do we have a motion? I move for approval based on staff recommendation with the exception that we don't include the requirement that the projecting sign be located on the third story window, but instead allow it to be lowered as the applicant has uh, proposed with the further condition that all the checkerboard in its original materials remain um, in the project. I second that. Okay. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. The next one is 1421 Calvin Avenue. Fourteen Twenty One Calvin Avenue, uh, and this is an application for new construction infill on a vacant lot at the corner of Calvin and North Fifteenth Street. The lot was recently subdivided from a triple lot, uh, and on that lot there's a con or was a contributing structure in the center uh, that's now to the left. Uh, and as I said, this is at the corner. The house will meet the base zoning setbacks. Uh, it will be 10 feet from the side street and five feet from the left side property line. The front edge of the new house will line up with the front porch of the house next door and with other houses on up the streets. Because the house next door, you can kind of see it in the top picture, has an 11 foot deep front porch, which is uh, particularly deep uh, for the area. And because the infill has a parcel width porch, which you'll see, the line of the infill's front wall will be forward of the solid front wall of, of the adjacent house. However, if staff finds that there are similar porch configurations in the area and going up the, uh, lining up the new house with the infill or the, with the porch of the house next door is appropriate. Uh, here are a few pictures of similar porch configurations uh, in the neighborhood. Um, two actually are across, the two on the bottom there are across 15th Street. Uh, they all have a partial width porch uh, with the solid wall uh, acting as part of the leading edge of the house. Uh, I'd say that the porch configurations on the bottom are there actually essentially identical to the one being proposed. The proposed infill will be one and a half stories tall with a ridge height of 27 and a half feet from grade. Um, by comparison, the house next door is approximately 22 feet tall and the house immediately behind this one uh, which, what's that, Stratton Avenue, is uh, 30 feet tall. Um, other houses in the immediate context along Calvin and North 15th Street range in height from 20 uh, to 30 feet tall as well. Uh, ha staff finds that the infill's height uh, is compatible with that of the historic context. Staff also finds that the width of the house, 35 feet, uh, also is compatible with the historic context where houses range between 32 and 44 feet wide. Uh, all of the known materials have been approved by the commission in the past, uh, including uh, cement fiberboard as the primary siding, uh, five inch reveal smooth siding on that, uh, vertical siding and shingle siding used in the gable fields and as accent features. Um, asphalt shingle roof staff would need to approve the color for that. Um, also needed would be uh, staff approval of windows and doors and a material for the stone, uh, which is a, a cladding material for the foundation. Um, staff is also asking that the front porch columns have more substantial cap and base than what is shown. Uh, they, I guess, look a little slender, uh, need a little uh, proper finishing on the porch columns. On the uh, side elevations, uh, both right and left would have 
uh, side shed roof dormers. The dormers are set below the ridge and in from the wall below, uh, which is typical of dormers uh, historically. Um, they are uh, each 30, proposed to be 36 feet long uh, from the front towards uh, the back, uh, going along with the uh, front oriented dormer or gable of the roof, excuse me. Uh, staff asks, asks that a con as a condition of approval, the dormer on the right side, uh, which faces south, or excuse me, north 15th Street, that that be divided or broken up into two sections, two dormers. Um, the, uh, the first story, uh, actually, I'm sorry, uh, you'll see that the, the windows on the infill are on both stories are generally twice as tall as they are wide, which is compatible with the proportions of historic windows. And there are no large expanses of wall space, uh, uh, particularly there on the first story, um, on both facades, but uh, certainly on the, uh, the visible North 15th Street facade. Uh, this uh, is compatible with the fenestration and window patterns that you would find on historic houses nearby. Uh, here's a, a view of the rear elevation uh, and some, some views of the surrounding context. The top there is uh, the house uh, that was on the triple lot, 1421 Calvin Avenue. As I said, it's been divided. So this is infill to the right, and I suppose later there will be another project on the, the lot that's to the left. Uh, and then the, those are going up on the north side of Calvin. These are houses across the street on the south side of Calvin. And uh, here are a few directly across uh, south, excuse me, I keep saying that, north 15th Street. Uh, coming back to the front elevation there, staff uh, concludes that we recommend approval of the infill with the following conditions. That staff approves samples of the stone windows and doors and the shingle color for the roof and that the, and also the material of the porch floor. Uh, that the long dormer on the right uh, elevation be divided up, broken into two components. That the front porch columns have more substantial columns and bases. Looks like they have good bases. Uh, that a central walkway be added leading from the sidewalk up to Calvin Avenue, um, and that the HVAC units be located on the rear or, or on the non-street facing facade of the house uh, behind the midpoint. With these conditions, staff finds that the project meets the applicable sections of the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation District Design Guidelines. Thanks, Sean. Any questions? Sean, how much of a division between in splitting up that right that right elevation dormer? How much division between the two do you anticipate? If you think of it as being thirds uh, or divided into thirds, I think the elimination of the, the center portion would be sufficient. So if it's 36 feet wide, you could take out 12 feet and have two 12 foot sections on either side. Uh, that's a, a good range, something like that, and I'm sure a couple feet either way. Uh, Would that allow them to make two, make, you know, if you split into thirds and it's 36, could those 12s become 14s and 16s as long as there's sufficient distance, or is it already sort of maxing out the dormer footprint? I think that there's some room for uh, flexibility. I'm not, you know, we'd have to look at how it, how it actually works once you see it in the drawing. And is it uh, not on the left because the left it's not is facing this exactly. It's it's interior. Mm -hmm. um, it's visible only obliquely from between this and the adjacent house. Whereas the street elevation um, is just that much more visible. Has the applicant agreed to split the dormer? Have you discussed that? They've considered it, but they would certainly like to have the current proposal is, is what they're preferring to have uh, reviewed and submitted. Uh, I believe all of the other conditions are things that they are uh, willing or happy, maybe not happy, willing to accept. Looks like they could cut back their that closet, right? Is that what you were thinking about? or? Uh, I apologize, I don't have the floor plans with me up here, but I can take a look. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, is the applicant here? If you'd like to come forward and cite your name and address. 
Good afternoon. I'm Jamie Day. Um, I live at 1514 Long Avenue in East Nashville. I also own a property at 401 um, Chapel Avenue in East Nashville, and then my business partner and I bought this property. Um, so this will be our our first renovation together. Um, everything that we've done is is to codes um, as requested by the Historical Society. Uh, the only difference is we would like to have the one dormer on the street side, um, just like on the other side as well. And that's just to because of our floor plan and our layout um, just to get the most, uh, I guess, bang for the buck or uh, the most square footage that we can up there to give that open concept and that open feel that people want these days. Um, we have already ordered um, some supplies and things of that nature. It's going to be a very structurally sound house. We have ordered I-beams, so it's not going to be just one by tens all through the house. It's going to be very structurally sound. Um, those are already on, on the way. Um, so it, it will be a nice house. We're obviously going to uh, comply by all the rules and regulations of the Historical Society as far as the, uh, the, the materials used, the colors used, and things of that nature. And we have done that before in the past. I just finished a product uh, project on Manila Avenue uh, that was in an overlay. Um, it wasn't historical like this, but it was in an overlay. And so that went really well. So. OK, thank you. Any questions to the applicant? I see where you're coming from the dormer, but um, have you looked at reducing the size of it or, or cutting it back, at least in that closet area, to break up that elevation? Right. We have actually submitted plans uh, that have two dormers on it, but we wanted to see to try our best to get this one approved because this is the plan that we wanted originally. Uh, when they came and asked us to have two dormers instead on the street side, uh, we had our architect um, uh, do some additional plans, so they already have those um, in hand. So it does work, just that gives you a 90 instead of 100. Yeah, it just doesn't give us what we really wanted, because uh, we wanted to ha have a uh, master bedroom upstairs as well as downstairs, um, two bedrooms and another bathroom upstairs, and then um, an office space downstairs. So if we start uh, reducing some of that space, I think some of the bedrooms are going to suffer for that reason. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I, what I was suggesting is maybe instead of two maybe you keep the span from the bath to the bedroom but just bring back the closet somewhat and it gives you just to break it up i mean maybe there's an opportunity there mm -hmm. we'll do we'll do what what we need to do to to make it work so all right thank you very much yes. open public hearing uh, anyone like to speak on our gardens project just come forward and say your name and address my name is Rebecca Rotz. I live at 1409 Gartland Avenue in the Lachlan Springs uh, overlay. And I have a couple concerns about the proposal. My first is the setback along Calvin. Um, staff mentioned that the facade comes to the same setback as the porches, the porch next door. But, and, and they also mentioned offset facades and, and that there are examples of those in, in other places in the neighborhood, but along this side of the street for at least six houses, that is not the case. And there's actually a very clear view through everyone's porch consistently down the street. And in this proposal, 40% of the building mass is now moving closer to the street. And in my opinion, that will drastically alter the feel of, um, of that side of Calvin Avenue. Or, and the other issue with offset facades is, in most cases, not actually the three that were shown by staff today, but in most cases, even with an offset facade, the porch still extends beyond the building facade, and so the porch has more prominence on the street, um, as well as, um, let's see. My other, my other concern, um, just moving forward, is with the facade on the 15th Avenue side, or the 15th Street side. Um, there's really no relation at all to the side street. This is a corner lot, and I think it's very important. The design guidelines also mention that the secondary facade on a corner lot is supposed to be res reviewed in a similar manner to the primary facade. And you know, it doesn't need a second front door or anything, but the but the front porch in no way relates around the corner. And and then it's just one long 74-foot building wall. There's no bays. There's no setback toward the back of the house. So it's just, even with windows, it's still one long, monotonous wall. Um, 
and I think it's very important for the commission. Um, there's another vacant lot two doors down. There's a double lot behind this, so I think look, reviewing this plan is going to set an, a precedent because there's going to be some redevelopment in the neighborhood. Um, and again, I just want to reiterate the issue with the 40% 40, 40 of the building mass um, coming further toward the street. I brought two pictures. One is of the, the, the porches. So this is from about five or six blocks up looking down and you kind of see the porches and how they're all open. And the other picture is actually of a corner lot that you all approved recently that I think does a really good job with a corner porch and more details on that secondary facade. Thank you. Okay, anyone else like to speak for this project? Hi, my name's Gary French. I live at 1402 Calvin Avenue. Been there on that street for 16 years, and uh, we are seeing the new buildings that are going up in our neighborhood, and we're used to having lawn, not house, and this house is going to swallow that lot, and it is on the corner. And I don't know if you're all familiar with Calvin, Calvin Avenue, but we are a very special street. and moving that house forward and blocking Jay and Michelle's house, which is the one that's in that picture. If you all do that and then they build the same on the other side, it's going to smother that house because the new house that they're proposing is going to smother Jay and Michelle's house now. It's just too big. And like she said, it's kind of plain Jane for our street. We mostly have bungalows and brick tutors. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Hayes, 1011 North 16th Street. Um, I did want to just support the two that came before and really encourage you to look much harder at the, the facade that faces South 15th. That within these overlay guidelines, and we keep saying historic, but it's really conservation overlay, um, the corner lots are so much more scrutinized than the middle lots. If you saw a house of this depth in the middle lot, it really only affects the two adjacent neighbors. It's not really visible. Um, we realize a lot of developments are coming in and try to max maximize lot coverage and to the gentleman's point you know that's not really been the context in our neighborhoods that we've had a hundred percent lot coverage um, you know it deals with stormwater which we don't really get to talk about with a lot of these but the depth of this house and the facade that faces north 15th is is pretty extreme and, and to, Cal, to, the, to the point about Calvin it's it's a lot of smaller homes that don't really go back that depth but I would just ask that you look harder and more critical at the, the facade that faces South 15. I think staff recommendations about the dormer are very adaptable to that. Uh, I haven't, we obviously are not seeing the floor plan out here, but it sounds like there's some rework that could happen with that. But I know there were a few gasps in the crowd when uh, that, that facade was shown, just because it looks like a ship. It's so long compared to the front. Uh, and maybe it's the, you know, even the compatibility of the historic windows, we talk about height versus width. This is you know, compatible on the front, but when you look at the width, it's just so long. So I just wanted to bring those to your attention. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right, close public hearing. Uh, discussion or questions? Yeah, could the staff respond to the comments on the elevation, please? On the, uh, the front setback or the side elevation? Um, well, the, uh, as I said, the, the front, the front, it has a partial width porch. Uh, so the, the open porch section is set back six feet and then the, uh, the wall, uh, under the gable with the three part window on the left side, uh, that is at the same edge, uh, the leading edge of the house, uh, which as I showed here is uh, an identical situation to three houses um, on the street, uh, or actually two are across the street. Uh, 410 is up a little to the west on Calvin. 
um, in the context pictures you can hear, hear, see here, uh, several houses. Uh, these are immediately across the street. They have, um, as the, the neighbor said, um, projecting porches, porches that project some, but they're also partially recessed. And going further, maybe you can't see on the bottom picture there, but there are Tudor houses, Tudor style houses, that actually have uh, a completely solid wall or a, a small vestibule for the front porch. So staff felt um, that this configuration of a partial with recessed front porch was actually very compatible with uh, much of the historic context. Uh, as I also said, this uh, house here to the left, the, the historic house uh, that was in the middle of the lot, it's, as I said, has an 11 foot deep front porch. So it's actually set back significant, not set back, but the solid wall is set back significantly further. Um, this would actually be that solid wall there because it's a carport built on the side. So this is the, the solid wall. Um, in my analysis, I didn't write the staff recommendation, but I did take a drive by to make sure I was familiar with it. I don't see there being the character of being able to look down the street through the porches. Uh, as far as the side setback, or excuse me, the side uh, facade. Uh, yes, the, the house is, uh, is longer. Again, keep, sorry to keep switching back, but it's about uh, 15 feet longer than the, the house uh, adjacent it. Um, and we did have a concern about that long monotonous expanse uh, for, the, for the dormer. Sorry, I keep flipping there. Uh, the dormer, um, not so much for the first story because one, it's, it's much lower. It's, it's uh, essentially a one and a half story house. Uh, and with the, the fenestration pattern on the right elevation being so regular, uh, a window approximately every 12 feet, it was very compatible with the rhythm of windows that you see in historic houses. Uh, it's, it's very simple, yes. Uh, I think someone called it plain Jane. But um, as far as just adding complexity for the sake of complexity to break it up, we didn't think that that was necessary. The applicant is willing to work with staff on doing something to help break that up, maybe a bay window on that side. So they are flexible and willing to work with staff on that at a later date. I, I do feel like that could be good to do something more to that. Um, yeah, that was good. <clears throat> Okay, any more discussion and or a motion? Now, I just want to say that I'm I'm bothered by the, the mass, the length, the width, or whatever it is, alongside the Calvin there. Um, and so it would be really good, I think, if the applicant worked something else up here to break this boat looking or ship looking uh, configuration up a little bit. Thanks. All right. Let's do it. Um, I move approval based on staff recommendation um, with the additional uh, note that applicant work with staff to help um, break up, so to speak, the right elevation um, to respond to some of the comments we heard from the public, I guess, um, or just sort of break up that length, particularly at the bottom, and then also um, do something with the dormer on the top, or the top dormer. Okay, we have a motion. Second. I have a motion and properly second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, the next is 1720 Fourth Avenue North. This is an application to demolish a non contributing structure seen here and to construct a duplex and two detached garages. The garages require a setback determination. The existing house was constructed circa 1988, much later than the period of significance for the overlay. The building's materials, form, and style are not in keeping with the Salem Town neighborhood, and it does not contribute to the historical and architectural character of the district. Staff finds its demolition to meet the design guidelines. 
The info will be centered on the lot. The porch of the projecting right unit will be set back approximately 28 feet from the front property line. By comparison, the one-story non-contributing house to the right of this site is set 24 feet from the front property line. To the left of the site is a vacant lot, and the one-story shotgun house to the right of the lot is approximately, from the vacant lot, excuse me, is approximately 18 feet from the front property line. Because the new duplex will be two stories and significantly taller than the non-contributing structure to its left and the shotgun house to its right, staff finds that the front setback, which is pushed back slightly from that of its neighbors, is appropriate. The new duplex will be 34 feet wide at the front, will expand to be 42 feet wide at a distance of over 40 feet back from the front porch. Staff finds this width to match surrounding context where one story houses range in width from 15 to 36 feet. The two garages require a setback determination. When considered together, the square footage of the garages is more than 700 square feet. The base zoning setbacks for the garages are five feet from the side property lines and 20 feet from the alley. The garages meet the side setbacks as they will be a minimum of six feet from the side. However, they require a setback determination for the rear because they are proposed to be located 10 feet from the alley. Staff finds the proposed rear setback of 10 feet to be appropriate. The proposed duplex will have a gabled L form. The left unit will have a 16 foot eave height and a ridge height of 31 feet above grade. The right unit will have an eave height of 21 and a half feet and a ridge height of 32 feet. The porch eave height will be approximately 12 feet. Guidelines state when there is little historic context, existing construction may be used for context. Primary buildings should not be more than 35 feet tall. Because there is little historic context on this street and because of the height of the non-historic structures ranges between 17 and 34 feet, staff finds the proposed height meets design guidelines. The known materials have all been approved by the commission in the past, including cement fiberboard, lap siding, board and battens, concrete block foundation, shingles for the primary roof, uh, standing seam metal porch roof, and wood windows and doors. The windows on the proposed duplex are generally twice as tall as they are wide, thereby meeting historic proportions of openings. The casement window in the second story of the projecting gable, marked in red here, is about a foot taller than the windows on the first story. The design guidelines state that windows on upper floors shall be no taller than the windows on lower floors. Staff asks that this window be reduced so that it is no taller than the windows below. On the right elevation ground floor, there is an expanse of approximately 20 feet without a door or window opening, and staff asks that an opening of at least four square feet be added to break up this expanse. The rear facade and a perspective of the front. The garages uh, measure 20 by 20 feet each. They will be located at the rear of the property and will be accessed by the alley with garage doors facing the alley. photos for context along the east side of 4th Avenue North. Looking at the uh, duplex site, the two bottom photos are of the properties across 4th Avenue. Beg your pardon. Staff recommends approval of the project with the conditions of approval of the windows and doors, shingle color, metal roof color, and materials for the porch floor and steps, that the window on the front facade's second story projecting bay be no taller than the windows below, a window opening of at least four square feet be added on the right elevation in the area of the kitchen, and the HVAC units be located on the rear facade or on a side facade beyond the midpoint of the house. Meeting these conditions, staff finds that the project meets Salem Town design guidelines. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, any questions? I have, I have one question for Paul. Yeah. Um, the properties on the s left or right side of that vacant lot, are they contributing or non-contributing? I believe they are both non-contributing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Is the applicant here or like to speak? I'm Preston Quirk, architect for the project, and we're in agreement with the staff conditions for this. Uh, Robin and I and Melissa and I had a lot of debate getting here, but we're glad to be where we are. So, no other comments. Okay. Any questions for Preston? Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. Open public hearing. Anyone like to speak uh, regarding this project? Okay. Close public hearing. Discussion or motion? I just want to ask the staff, I don't think I asked it last time, the Salem Town over, in, in the Salem Town overlay, is it, I mean, these home, homes of these sizes are, are encouraged, I guess, because we've seen a couple of them, right, of this size? I wouldn't say that they're encouraged, but there is the recognition that a great deal of the historic architecture is gone, and so we're balancing, in this case, we're balancing our context between new construction and historic. Where normally you would just block out the new construction and just focus on historic, this one we're kind of trying to balance in between the realities of what's there and the historic context. I move approval based on staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. The next is 1107 Lillian Street. <clears throat> Didn't even not use all your slides on that one. All right. Uh, this is an application for demolition of a primary building and infill construction in its place at 1107 Lillian Street in the Lachlan Springs neighborhood, uh, East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Uh, 1107 Lillian Street, that is currently a non-contributing house. It was constructed in 1957 when this lot was subdivided off of a lot that faced Father, or does face Fatherland Street. Demolition of that non-contributing structure is appropriate. Uh, and uh, before moving on from this to the new construction, you'll see in that photo the driveway to the left. I think I described that in the recommendation as being the driveway for this house. Uh, now that I see the survey stake when I went out and took the picture, I see it actually uh, goes with 1105. Uh, so the, this house does not have a driveway. It has a telephone pole in the front yard. Moving on, the new construction. Uh, the sub subsequent infill will be, uh, in effect, a one and a half story house with side gabled form with clipped gable ends. Uh, that basic form is very common throughout the historic district. Um, the uh, three part dormer there, uh, and that's actually a partially re uh, recessed front porch. Uh, those two features uh, in and of themselves are not necessarily, uh, certainly not common in the historic district, but they are found. Uh, here just an example on the top of a similar, somewhat similar three-part dormer. And then uh, the bottom picture there is a, a house with a partly recessed uh, uh, center front porch. The, um, the height and width of the house, uh, I've described in the staff recommendation you received. Uh, staff found it to be in keeping with the proportions of nearby historic houses. Uh, the historic context on Lillian Street itself being uh, pretty weak. Uh, we've we expanded and looked uh, just half a block over, or less than that, I should say, to uh, South 11th Street and also to, to Fatherland Street, uh, where many of the Lillian Street lots originated. Uh, so with that context, staff found that the scale of the new house is compatible. Um, however, uh, the proposed house would not meet the standard bulk zoning 20-foot rear setback. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is not because the house is unusually long. In fact, it's only 40 feet uh, front to back, but it's the lot uh, that's only 70 feet deep. Uh, you can see there uh, the lot, this lot 1107 in yellow, uh, is about 40 feet shorter than the typical lot on uh, the north side of Lillian Street. Uh, so it, it's for that reason that they've requested a determination of the rear setback uh, proposed which they are proposing of 10 feet to be appropriate. Uh, and staff finds that the building itself being of compatible scale, uh, that this rear setback is appropriate. Uh, the proposal also includes a paved parking area at the very front of the lot. And that's certainly not something you would generally see in a historic district. Uh, but as you can see on this picture here on the north side of Lillian Street, keeping in mind that site plan uh, as 
as, as you look. Uh, the north side of Lillian Street is uh, it's pretty steep. Uh, there is no alley at the rear, and there is no sidewalk. Um, and as uh, because of that, you can see, of course, some houses have side dri driveways. But the majority of people, it seems, uh, in my travels there, just seem to pull in and park on the edge, kind of half on the street, half in the grass. You can see um, a lot of the grass is, is actually worn away or, or dead on the side because of that. Here's just some more examples of, of that. Uh, uh, pattern, trend in the neighborhood. So staff felt that that paved parking area, uh, not a pull-in paved parking pad, but essentially just a parallel, uh, essentially keeping the existing condition, but with a, a legal parking spot on the edge of the front of the lot. Staff found that to be a much more appropriate solution. Uh, as I said, there's some more of the context. Uh, and then uh, the materials of the new house are pretty typical for infill. Uh, nowadays, cement fiber siding, asphalt shingle roof, split face block foundation, uh, as is uh, often the case. Staff will need to approve the window and door material as well as the uh, colors of uh, roofing. Uh, but in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the application to demolish the non-contributing house at 1107 Lillian Street and to construct a new one and a half story house with conditions that the color of the roof, the material of the windows and doors, and the location of the HVAC are approved by staff. With those conditions met, staff finds that this application meets the design guidelines for the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Uh, I received a uh, comment from some neighbors, and I imagine that was passed out before the meeting, uh, but I think there might be some others, and uh, the applicant is here if you have any questions for them. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Sean? Um, it is, un I've done, the little sidewalk is driveway in front, is pretty unusual um, for us, but. We have approved that in the past, though, haven't we, on this particular street? because there's, it's unusually narrow and... Yes, there have been a few different attempts at things approved. There was the, the pull-in lot, uh, but because the, the lots are, even the, this one is really shallow at only 70 feet, but even the others are not the standard depth of a lot in Lachlan Springs. You're still just kind of pulling into the front of the house. Uh, Public Works actually had an issue with that because although it might never happen, they have on the books a plan to put a sidewalk down Lillian so mm -hmm. sort of new construction has to accommodate a future sidewalk plan that may or may not ever happen. I have a first impression. I'm going to take one of the commissioners uh, comment there. Can, can you roll back to the uh, front facade and look at the dormer because we're so yes. I think that's probably an unusual that I, <clears throat> for me just to, to see that um, the middle section of the dormer and has is that and I, and I think you commented that that's not unusual to the area is that correct is that what you're it's not unheard of it's I won't say that of. it's common so in your purview of approving that can you give a little logic on it? The overall form of the house is the side gabled bungalow with the clipped ends. Uh, and that being the, the primary massing is a very common feature or a common uh, characteristic of houses historically. Uh, the applic applicant actually went through a couple iterations of a double gable um, kind of a one and a half story version, kind of part two story. This is kind of, this is maybe the second version of three and we came back and said, well, you know, that was too too far, this one's not enough. So um, looking at the, the context, finding at least the, the one example in the, the uh, slideshow of a similar dormer, um, <coughs> staff found that to be an appropriate solution. Due to floor planning? <laughs> I mean, is there, it looks like more like a clear story, you know, kind of effect in the interior. Um, I guess we didn't really look at the floor plan, but if you eliminate that center portion, I'm not sure how it would affect their floor plan, but a pair of clipped gables or hipped gables 
uh, excuse me, dormers on on uh, on that uh, is is also very common. The only less common, uncommon element would be the the shed connection between. Uh, it is pushed back uh, about half the the. Um, half the depth of, of the two dormers There's an on either side. In front of it. Okay. Do, you, do you think the example that that's original to that home, or do you think that was added later? Is there any way to tell? I'm not able to tell. Um, I have seen this one. It, that is in uh, Lachlan Springs. There are other similar dormers, um, actually closer to our office in, in uh, 12 South neighborhood that I believe are historic, but with the, the windows being replaced and the siding not looking original, it's, it's hard to tell with that one. I can jump in and add a little bit to that. Um, you approved a similar dormer in um, Belmead Lanks uh, three, two or three years ago. And as you know, we constantly receive requests for very, very large homes, larger and larger. So this was one way to keep it to one and a half stories and get some usable space. And as Mr. Alexander said, that middle portion is lower and set back from the two gabled pieces, which we th thought helped um, minimize the largeness of it. Like in this image, being one piece, that front wall being all uh, flush makes that look fairly large, but on this one, they're pulling back that middle section. So that was some of the thinking on that too. All right, thanks, Sean. Um, would the applicant like to come forward and say your name and address? My name is Jason Feller. I live at 1115 Douglas Avenue uh, in East Nashville. Um, uh, barring any particular objections or questions, I just appreciate the opportunity to speak and uh, you to consider this house. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Okay, thanks, Jason. Okay, open public hearing. Uh, anyone would like to speak regarding this project? My name is Michael Kraling. I'm at 1201 Holly Street. I come here as president of Rediscover East, a neighborhood organization over there. The basic problem with the proposal for 1107 Lillian is it's too big for a small lot, at least is so designed here. The oversized dormer with its peculiar combination of two gables and one shed, the 40-foot width, the 10-foot setback variance, and two-car parking pad out front are all elements reflective of a desire to cram a suburban-style house into a small urban lot. When these lots on Lillian were subdivided from the properties on Fatherland in 1957, the houses constructed on them were small cottages, acknowledging the limitations of the lots. The current owner-developer of 1107 Lillian acquired the property presumably knowing the lot size and the rear setback requirement. We don't see why MHCC should relax setback standards, curb cut policy, dormer design practice, and standard width in this block to accommodate this proposal. In addition to the impact of the specific building, approval will set a precedent for oversized and inappropriate architectural intrusions into East Nashville that will last far beyond our lifetimes. The proposed front dormer in its two gable with shed aggregate in terms of solids and voids, as well as massing in style contrasts in an architecturally inappropriate manner with the surrounding historical context. Moreover, the lot width at 49, 11 and 3 quarters inches is not narrower than usual, it's just less deep than usual. Therefore, it is problematic to use lot size to justify a wider footprint for the house. It is also problematic to use the houses on Boscobel and 11 to justify a wider footprint since these have no visual relation to the house on Million. You can't see it from there. In addition, the house on Boscobel is an L form, distinct with the bungalow-like presentation in the proposed structure, with the majority of the front of the building recessed behind a porch, traditional in our neighborhood. And the house on 11th is an architectural oddity, as if two houses, house plans were mushed into one with two window placements of unequal size and height under the right gable. It can't be used as a precedent. 
The owner developer bought the property, presumably knowing that the lot was less deep than usual and standard rear setback would be required. Therefore, it is problematic to use lot size to justify violating standard rear setback. Covering a lot with larger impervious surface can induce storm rider runoff problems. A large two-story massing on the rear of, a proposed of this proposed structure, if only 10 feet from the rear property line, can impact the privacy of adjoining lots to the rear and have a negative impact on their property values. The large massing on the second story of the rear facade should be enough to accommodate a functioning second story with a dormer in front based on existing smaller dormers in the 11 and 1200 block of Lillian. We supplied some photos taken the other day. And where is the house with the Time. double gable and shed that sourced the image? It appears to be 941 West Eastland. If so, while the houses in the 1920s and 30s, according to the builder workmen on the site this morning, the dormer is new and derived from the one apparently in the 1950s or 60s house across the street. Sir, if you don't mind, you better just wrap up real quick here. Um, you have I, the full yeah, comments on your desk. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Was he given five or two minutes? Two minutes. He was representing Rediscovery Sniper and Association. Any comments? Uh, yeah, only the applicant actually gets the five minutes, but um, thank you for noting that. Um, would others like to come and also speak about this project? My name is Alan Hayes, 1011 North 16th. I've, forgive me for speaking out of turn before. Um, I'm, I also serve on the Board of Rediscoveries with Michael and, and just wanted to make sure he had good time to, to speak. Uh, my only comments are again to the dormer. Um, I, I'd hate to see approval based on something two or three years ago and based on one potential oddity in the neighborhood. Um, I know when I went through my application process, the dormer, we, I'd originally gone with a two-story piece. I ended up just doing a one-story addition to my house, but the dormer was very highly critiqued. Even the size and width of it on my home uh, was very highly critique. So I know those, you know, we talked about rarities earlier. Those those are high high demand and always wanted to be there. So just want to discourage from doing any kind of precedent with this. It, it does sound like there's a lot of uh, availability of natural light and headroom without that central central center con connection. And also to your comment about the uh, parking on the street, I would be very concerned if that sets, if that's not really common along the street and also to any future sidewalks. We all hope we get more walkability in, in our neighborhoods and sidewalks are going to be a big deal even if they're not there now even if they're there 20 years from now i'd hate to see them have to tear something out just to put sidewalks in so those are my comments thank you thank you any other comments My name is Britt Withers, 1113 Granada. I sort of take exception to y'all granting a, a variance to make that house actually wider, knowing then the, the context, knowing uh, that this is a house that actually has parking problems. I think that keeping the house within the context would allow a side driveway, which is very similar to what is currently in place for many of the properties, rather than placing a carve out into a hill that will, that will greatly obstruct um, pedestrian access along the street in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, any others? All right, close public hearing. Discussion? There's a lot to unpack here, and it's, I think, ostensibly driven by the lot being very small. Um, it's 70 feet deep, which is really odd. I don't think it can, it, the lot is, is a hardship to some degree, but I don't think it necessarily follows that it entitles you to push the envelope four or five different ways. And I come out with, you've got this parking carve out, as Mr. Withers noted, that is really a condition because you've made the house so wide that you can't fit a driveway. I think the house is too wide. It's 40 feet wide. The range in staff's uh, recommendation is 28 to 34. This is significantly more than that. Though there are other examples, it's again driven by this, this small lot size. The dormer combination is incredibly unusual. The 10 foot rear setback is absolutely not a precedent I want to set 
that's on top of the next lot in the rear. I think that's, I can't imagine we've ever done that um, with anything but a garage. And then again, because we're trying to maximize square footage on a very small lot, there's just this tiny little porch on the front. So there, to me, there's just so many problems. I don't know how you begin to unpack it and come up with conditions that can fix it. And that's sort of where I am. I actually I completely agree with all those. I felt like the, the small size lot is part of the unique character of the neighborhood and the house that is on that should fit that not. So I, um, I'm, I guess I'm more on the setback more than anything, but even more than the dormers. But I do agree. There's a, um, pretty much everything you said, Aaron. I won't try to add to all the, the how well you articulated that, Aaron. I just want to emphasize that um, that what one of the speakers said in opposition, the house is just too big for the lot. That's what I was thinking before he came up and spoke, and then he just said it. He nailed it for me. It's just too big. Mini or Richard? Anything else? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, motion? It's kind of might be difficult. I'll um, make a motion to disapprove the application based on. I need to pull out so my specific have, references. They have two things going on. We have demolition and, and reconstruction. Sorry, sorry. Let me handle these in turn. Yeah. Um, make a motion to approve demolition based on staff recommendation. I guess second. second. Okay. All in favor of just the demolition part, um, please signify by saying yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Hi. <laughs> that messed me up. Okay. Uh, all opposed? Okay. Motion to approve demolition is carried. I'll make a motion to disapprove the infill construction based on guideline 2B2, scale 2B3, setback and rhythm of spacing, 2B5, the roof shape, 2B7, the proportion rhythm of openings. Actually, I take back seven. Go with the others. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We have a motion, a second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries disapproval of 1107 new construction. Infill. Okay. The next on the agenda is 1825th Avenue North. This application is to approve a blue Camaro at 1820 Mustang, sorry, sorry. Uh, actually, infill construction at 1820 Fifth Avenue North. Um, it is a vacant lot. Uh, there was a house there uh, that I believe was a historic house, but it was demolished prior to the enactment of this zoning overlay. Um, the proposal is now to construct a one and a half story uh, two family dwelling uh, with the, the form essentially of a side gabled house. Uh, the height and width of the building will be in keeping with the proportions of surrounding historic buildings. Uh, and as with the previous Salem Town case, uh, we do to some extent uh, look at the existing context, both historic and more recent. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's compatible with that context. Um, we did find, however, that the height of the porch, uh, the roof and the eave, uh, and the thickness of the floor were essentially, they were slight, uh, giving the appearance that the second story of the house is greater in massing than the first story. So uh, staff finds with uh, the front 
porch components revised, essentially lifting up the the roof of of the porch. Uh, that the scale of the infill would be compatible with the surrounding context. The materials of the building, again, are uh, very typical uh, modern new con infill construction, asphalt, shingle, roof, uh, cement fiber, siding, uh, split face block foundation. Staff uh, would need to approve the window and door materials, and uh, there's brick columns that we would need to see a sample of. Uh, but those are, are fairly standard conditions for new construction. The front of this building will align with the fronts of adjacent buildings. Uh, again, the highlighted in yellow there is this property with the the footprint of the house that's now been demolished, uh, but the new house will align with the front of the adjacent structure, which is historic. Um, you'll see on the site plans you got uh, that there's a garage shown. Uh, uh, we're not reviewing plans for that today. Uh, my understanding in discussions with the applicant is, is that it's just a one-story garage, two-car, uh, so it sounds like something that can be approved administratively. We're just concentrating or looking at the house today. And staff recommends approval of the new two-family infill construction with the following conditions, that the roof and eaves of the front porch be raised to make the perceived height of the first story taller in relation to that of the upper story, that the thickness of the porch floor and the porch rack be increased to be a size more compatible with those features on historic houses, that a water table be added uh, at the foundation line uh, of the first floor, uh, the staff review and approve all window and door selections prior to installation, uh, the color of the roof be approved by staff and brick samples, and that the HVAC unit be placed at the rear or on the side facade beyond the midpoint of the house. In meeting all of those conditions, staff finds that this proposal would meet the new construction guideline section of the guidelines for the Salem Town Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Thanks, Sean. Any questions? Yeah. Sean, ahead. this is my second time I'm asking this. Uh, are those contributing or non-contributing properties on each side? Again, uh, the one this, is vacant. This property right. uh, highlighted in yellow is now vacant. To the left, uh, and going up the street are uh, not quite to the, I guess, the la to the last one before Coffee Street are contributing. Uh, the two vacant lots to the right, 1818 and 1816, are uh, construction is in progress there on two recently approved projects, and then the one next to that is contributing. So let me let me clarify that again. 1822, 24, 25, those to the corner of Coffee, those are contributing buildings. Yes, but okay. uh, across the street, those are all. 2012, 2013, three-story duplexes are non-contributing. Okay, I will make comment on that later, but. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Sean. Um, would the um, applicant like to come forward and? I think they said they could answer questions, but otherwise, okay. Otherwise, they're just here. All right. I have a question. What is water table at? Um, so a water table is like a band board. Um, it's uh, just a, a material change or, or a, a thicker dimension of trim or molding that's right at the foundation line. It's kind of a, a vestigial uh, architectural feature. On masonry houses, it would have been, and, and historic wood houses, it would have deflected water away from the foundation. It, Modern foundations are waterproof to the point that it's not really necessary, but it still helps break up uh, the side foundation. You can't really see one on the side of that historic house. Um, Will there be railings required on the front porch? Do you know? Uh, that is a good question. I, I probably. Yeah, probably. So yeah. if there are, we'll we'll review I'm those. Asking. No, I, I, the applicant said it can be built such that the. The height of the floor won't won't require that. It's pretty close. Okay. Any other app questions for the applicant? Okay. 
um, open public hearing. Anybody like to speak regarding this project? Oh, I, you're the applicant, right? Okay, I'm sorry. I, no, I'm sorry. I, uh, I thought you didn't want to go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. more than happy to go along with staff recommendations. Okay, great. I feel like mine's rather boring after all you've heard before today, but, uh, but I'm more than happy to go along with the recommendations. That's fine. Okay. I'm good. If you got any questions, I, the, the, as far as rails on the front, I think it'll, only, it'll be only a couple of feet high, so they won't be required. It looks a little more about this, but so if you have to, you just make sure you bring that before the commission for review. Can we, is that some, something we could delegate to staff, though, right? Yeah, yeah. That's definitely <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to speak regarding this project? Okay. Okay, close public hearing. Um, discussion? This is something I don't know how to really articulate because I know our <clears throat> reviews have been quite a few on Salem Town. And um, in the and the reason why I ask the question is what are the, you know, is the building contributing and the pro adjacent properties contributing or not contributing? And I think sometimes in where we as a board, it becomes difficult for us to decide black and white or if it is, but where, if this is a historic building, we we have this guideline. If it's non-historic, then it's you know more lenient. But then we compare it contextually to the existing fabric of that neighborhood, and that's where I, I'm I'm thinking. You know, when another project comes to us, that's going to be a contributing non -con the contributing next door wants to do something, then it becomes more difficult for us because of the non-contributing infill. Does that make sense? I think that's just where I'm having a. But a you don't. Do you have any issue with this particular project? And and that no. I think okay. it's just a general comment about the no. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the whole issue with Salem Town. I think that makes it a little bit so unique that there's just not that many contributing structures there, and people have kind of gotten a little free free reign, so to speak, on what they can build. And the, the, the guidelines specifically say that you should consider this other new infill that wasn't even built under the exist the new guidelines. So mm -hmm. I think we have to, I think like you're saying, we'll have to figure it out. Right. I'm just commenting because it's we see so many projects from Salem Town come through and, you know, of course public hears us, you know, debate these things and it's just a matter of discussion and knowledge. Okay, do we have a... More discussion or motion on 1825th? I'll move approval based on staff recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, next one is 814 Petway Avenue. 814 Petway Avenue is an application for infill construction of a one and a half story house to be built on the first four floor framing of the structure seen here. Staff has approved partial demolition of this non-contributing house. The proposed building is one and a half stories and will be 26 feet tall from grade. The applicant proposes to widen the front section three feet eight inches to a total width of 35 feet eight. The height and scale of the new house are appropriate for the context. With staff review of materials, windows, door, doors, and the shutter shown on this elevation. The project meets guidelines for materials. The proposed infill also meets design guidelines for roof form, proportion and rhythm of openings, and site features. The new building meets the design guidelines for setback and rhythm of spacing. A walkway and driveway are proposed. Unfortunately, with the current plan of widening the, the house, the driveway would essentially be turned into a front yard parking pad as it would stop at the house. Therefore, Staff recommendation is that the existing driveway be removed and a new parking area be located behind the house to be accessed from McFerrin Avenue. Where could you just read that? To be accessed from where? From McFerrin Avenue, sir. This is uh, yeah. on the corner there of McFerrin. Context. The site is there on the left in the top photograph and across McFerrin on the bottom. 
Staff recommends approval of the infill at 814 Petway Avenue with the conditions of approval of windows, doors, shutter, porch materials, roofing material, and location of utilities, and that the existing driveway be removed and a new parking area to be approved by staff at the rear of the site. And I think the applicant is here to talk with us. To you. So, let me, so you're um, so the. You're not, you won't have it in the front, but you'll have the parking area in the back. And yes, the, is, our, is our concern is that widening the, the house would basically create a front yard parking situation. That and this will be in the back. Avoid. And um, is this what we're looking at off of Petway right here? Yeah, that's correct. Any other questions for staff? Okay, applicant. My name is Sin Rokar, I'm the project manager of this, and we're good with everything they've said except for the back driveway. Um, along McFerrin, which if you're looking at this picture, it runs to the left as you're looking. The elevation is... You can move if there's another slide. You can... nah, I didn't even look at the other slide. The elevation is about three or four foot off of McFerrin, so it, and there's a, an existing retaining wall there right now. I think it's city wall. I don't think it's property wall. Uh, it would kind of make a weird, there's three reasons why I'm going to go over. It would kind of make a weird dip to get in the back, number one. Number two, it kills your backyard. You have no green back there. Once you put a drive in there, it's already a shallow backyard, which is why we didn't expand the house, you know, the footprint of it, is we were trying to keep as much green as we could. Uh, secondly, the, there's a porch already attached to the house that's no no wider than what we're proposing widening it by. There's already a porch there that stopped the house, the cars from going back. And uh, it's, you're saying, we're only going three and a half feet. Well, that's the porch is three plus feet already, so you couldn't go any further than that. And also precedence on the street is all the same. All, all the houses to the right. And that's all I've got. Okay. Uh, any other questions for the applicant? So looking at the driveway there, you're wanting to pave it and make it 12 feet or something or? 10, 12, 10. Whatever, whatever they recommend is okay. fine with us. I just, we're, we're not looking to do anything that's not already there. In fact, we're gonna beautify it and make a nice walkway to it. And it, I'm telling you, the, the, the right set, that would cost us a lot of money to do what you're asking because there's a, like I said, there's a retaining wall. There's a three to four foot difference in elevation. So you're gonna you're gonna hit the bottom out every time you try to pull in and out. I don't know, but it just and it eats up. There's no backyard then, nothing. Trees of it would have to be removed. Everything. I think we. Is, am I right that we typically try to require if you're gonna reuse this driveway that you continue it past the house so that cars don't park in front. But it looks like, here's it, right, that you're gonna reuse the existing foundation or coming out the side so there isn't room to get There's around. There's a porch already there, right. Yeah. I'm not so hung up on which street has a curb cut because McFerrin's a major street, that way's the primary street to some houses, um, but it would be good if we could find a way to get it behind, but it doesn't look like you can get past the house based on the site plan. I mean, do you know how wide this is from the uh, proposed addition to the property line? Um, 13 feet is what shows on the on the application. I was thinking one of our older plans. I, yeah. I don't know if, if that's to that fence or it kind of looks like to it's the to fence. the house. It is to the fence. Yeah. Okay. So, there, so you still got a 10 foot setback, which is more than required because I think you can run once you get past X number of feet I think you can run a driveway right on your property line by code so maybe there is a way to get past the again house. though you're eating up the front yard or the backyard and there'd be nothing green back there anymore I mean it's up to you yeah. what you guys call it we're trying to keep it as green as we can we're trying to make the house look more historic that they're all just boxes all the way down the way I do, do like plan, that do you plan on parking any cars in the front yard <laughs> not me <laughs> I uh, I do like the idea though of trying to if it could go back. Um, yeah, I, mean, I appreciate that. It's more pavement, but it does accomplish the goal of getting the cars out of the front yard, which yeah. I think is a worthy one. 
maybe we can word our motion that if it doesn't work, whatever, to keep looking to it or something. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a motion. There you go. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the property, approve the uh, application based on staff recommendation, except that there would not be a requirement to have a new parking area at the rear of the property as stated by staff and that the existing driveway can be retained and that the applicant will try to push the driveway a little bit further back in the rear so that it'll encourage cars not to park in the front yard. <laughs> okay, any discussion? I mean, do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Uh, all opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Okay, 417 Park Circle. <laughs> Is this the last, last uh, regular business, although there is a, a follow-up? policy business. Um, uh, 417 Park Circle uh, in the Richland West End Edition Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. This is a vacant lot and the application is to construct a new two-family dwelling on the lot. The zoning does support duplexes. The front elevation uh, or in front elevation, the building will have the form essentially of a cross gabled bungalow. Um, the building will be one and a half story, although the grade drops towards the rear of the lot, allowing an additional story in the basement level. Uh, and actually the existing houses on the street, a lot of them have basement level garages, as will the new house. Uh, so staff found that this proposed height, or the, the height of the proposed building, is compatible with those in the surrounding area. The building will be 38 feet wide, um, for essentially the, the two-thirds of the building at the rear. The front third will only be 32 feet wide. Uh, this is a small district, and actually there were several houses on this street that were 38, 40 feet. Uh, so staff found that this width uh, was actually compatible with the surrounding historic context here. Uh, the narrower section, the front third of the building, uh, will be in, uh, in addition to being narrower, will be shorter with a gable uh, nested under the primary gable uh, with a shed roofed porch projecting uh, obviously to the front. Uh, as submitted on these plans, you'll see that the porch is not properly finished in its detailing. Uh, the, the primary eaves of the house have an overhanging eave. The porch roof uh, drawing does not. Uh, also, the, the porch beam and rack uh, are missing from the porch. Um, but uh, with a revision to the porch, staff found that the form was compatible with cross gabled bungalows in the area. The materials of the new building, again, uh, cement fiber siding, uh, asphalt shingle roof, split face concrete block foundation. Staff needs to approve windows, material, window materials, doors. Uh, as well as the materials of the porch floor and stairs and the colors of roofing and masonry. Um, and also, we would want those things to be labeled on the drawings um, before a permit is issued. In summary, staff recommends approval of the new construction with the following conditions, that staff approve the color of the roof and masonry, that the porch roof be revised to be more compatible with the surrounding uh, porches on historic houses. Staff approve the materials of the porch floor and the materials of the windows and doors and that the location of the HVAC unit be approved. Uh, and also uh, that wrapping up those things that the plans and elevations be updated with all materials and any changes and the dimensions labeled. And in meeting those conditions, staff finds that this application meets the design guidelines for the Richland West End edition overlay. 
Thank you, Sean. Any questions for Sean? The applicant was here, but not anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, any discussion? Motion? Motion. Okay. Second. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the motion? The motion was. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long day. I'm sorry. Uh, I move the approval of the uh, application at 417 Park Circle, subject to staff recommendations. Second. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. I'll also But we do have one more thing, and I'm sorry, we do have to cover it today because of, of the timing of all of this. But planning is looking at changing the um, definition of two family, which in a sense would mean that duplexes no longer have to be attached. So that gives us some opportunity, um, but it also puts a lot of pressure on us. So we want to be sure that we have a policy in place on exactly how we want to deal with these. This is just a draft. You're not asked to vote on anything today. This is just for your discussion. Um, as you know, uh, right now the attachments are creating things like this, not necessarily in the historic overlay, but they do happen. Historically, duplexes were one building with either two entrances on either side, or they may have had one entrance that went into a little hallway where there was a door to the first floor and stairs to the second floor. But for the most part, they are one building. And so we recommend that in most cases, this will still be what you're going to be looking at, that you're still going to be asking for duplexes to be one building. But there may be cases where it is appropriate for them to be detached. And so I wanted to run through some thoughts we had on maybe how that could happen. Again, this is just a draft. In general, the current draft says that subdivision should be the first action, if that's a possibility. The majority of duplexes should be one building, like we just saw in the historic context. Detached may be appropriate in rare instances. Demolition of historic buildings is not appropriate in order to build a duplex back or for any other reason. Uh, moving of historic buildings is rarely appropriate. In the case of a large lot that isn't big enough to be legally subdivided, but where two homes can be constructed next to each other in a manner that meets the rhythm of the street, they may be unattached buildings. Both units should face the primary street with entrances and porches. An unattached unit should not be constructed behind or in front of another unit unless following the standards of a detached accessory dwelling unit or if an existing building sits so far back on the lot that a primary building built in front of it would meet the context. And I have some examples for all of this. Um, then the, the uh, draft continues to talk about vehicular access possibilities. So this is an example in Belmont Hillsboro where there was an existing house. The lot was somewhat triangular shaped. You can see in the bottom image. And so there was enough frontage to build a second house next to it in a manner that met the rhythm of the street. So the widths of the two homes were similar to what you see historically, and the spacing in, in between was historic. Now, these are attached, as they had to be, but if this passes and this were presented, this may be an example of a, a type of duplex that would not have to be detached. And I also have to say that I don't believe there are very many lots that will meet this criteria. It's just some more examples of what this would mean or not mean. 1304 Calvin Street is a non-contributing building, therefore it's a candidate for demolition. Because the lot is similar in width to many other lots in the district, two detached buildings of any scenario in this location would be inappropriate. Because the lot is zoned two-family, if a duplex was desired here, it'd need to be one building, like the ones we saw a few minutes ago. On the other hand, 1515 Russell is also a non-contributing building. This lot 67 feet wide compared to the context, which is roughly 50 feet wide. Despite the fact that it's wider, there is no way to get two side-by-side -side buildings on this lot that meet the rhythm of the street. So here as well, a duplex would need to be one building. This lot is an example of a lot that is, or a building that is constructed far back on the lot. The street is at the top and the building is set far back. So this may be a case where a new building would be appropriate in front of it and not necessarily need to be attached. Corner lots, of course, are a fairly different animal. 
in some cases, just in some cases, two detached buildings might be appropriate if the lot is large enough to accommodate that. This is an example of one building on a corner lot with two primary entrances. And again, this is what we would recommend the majority of the, of the time. But another option for corner lots might be to allow for two detached buildings. However, this policy would require that the secondary unit be subordinate to the primary unit. These are districts where this could not happen, either because they're not zoned two family or because they don't have this kind of development on their corner lots. And by that, I mean the development of a primary building facing the primary street and a smaller building developed after that facing the secondary street. For those neighborhoods where two units, detached corner lots might be appropriate. The rear unit should be subordinate to the primary because that is what you see historically. Based on research of scenarios like this one, we're recommending the following restrictions for corner lots for detached buildings. When the units are detached, there shall be one primary building facing the primary street and meeting all the design guidelines. The secondary building shall face the secondary street and be no, no more than two thirds of the massing of the primary building. So that doesn't mean you can just make that primary building bigger, because it still needs to meet the guidelines too. And then in order to accomplish that two-thirds, we thought that the second unit should have fewer stories, or at least be the same, and be at least five feet shorter than the principal unit. The secondary unit square footage should be 50% less than the primary. Generally, duplexes, duplex lots should not have more than one garage. And by that, we mean one garage for the lot, not one for each building. Generally, there should be a minimum of 15 feet between the two buildings. Both units should have vehicular access from the alley where an alley exists, and then there's some more recommendations for vehicular access. Here's another example of a corner lot. Um, this is 1114 Calvin Street. The current building faces North 12th Street, so it could be demolished. And a more appropriate building facing Calvin Street constructed. If they, the developer pretty much maxed out their square footage on that first house, it might be one or one and a half stories because that's what the context is, about 26 feet tall. The width could be approximately 35 feet and the depth as much as 70 feet for 2,400 square feet. But if the primary building somewhat maxes out that potential, then the secondary building will only be about 600 square feet and will require a rear setback reduction. So you can see that this is, um, then, then there would be no opportunity for a garage in this scenario. So again, this is just a draft. We're going to schedule, or we have scheduled, three um, charrettes, brainstorming sessions that are open to the public. Anyone is welcome to come. The first one is going to be about this duplex policy to get some feedback, but we also wanted to get some feedback from you today. This is going before planning commission on Thursday, which was the reason that we wanted to get a jump on this and be ready to address these when they come to us. The other charrettes will be about new construction, and then the third will be about garages and detached accessory dwelling units. And so now I'd love to hear your feedback on this, or if you'd like more time to digest it and email comments, because again, we will be collecting comments from the public as well. My only comment is on the corner lots. It was a little bit like we looked at today where you've got a very small lot. It isn't very deep. When you have those little houses that address the secondary street in what would otherwise be the backyard of the primary house, um, they, they do have to be really small. And I think to the extent we don't control that, it's a can of worms because typically in the neighborhoods that weren't listed on there in your your list of where it wouldn't be allowed. You've got a lot of 50 foot wide lots, which means the depth for that second home is 50 feet, mm -hmm. which means you can't do much of anything. And right. historically, there wasn't much of anything. But when we've seen people in the past try to propose something like that, whether it was connected or not, the home was 45, 50 feet wide and claiming hardship because there was no depth. I, I don't, I'm just, my comment is I don't think that argument has any validity at all. And I just, whatever kind of widths we can really definitely determine, because I can just see us one day, you know, with, you know, going out a number of 75, well, this is 74, you know, this is 73, you know, it gets tighter and tighter, you know, so I just want to, whatever we can do to really kind of help with that, because it's just going to eventually get back to us, and we'll be like, you know, well, this is closer, you know. And well, am I hearing that 
if it's that maybe we should just not allow for detached on corner lots? On one, on I would one. say that when you look at it historically, what often happened is you have two long lots and they made three out of two, not two out of one. And there are examples of the two out of one, but the vast mm -hmm. majority of them, at least in the neighborhood I live in, are two become three. So it's 100 feet deep and a house does fit on it okay. It's short, but it's 100 feet deep. I don't know how you could fit in anything unless somebody wants to build a 600 square foot home, how you fit it if the depth of that other, of the second home is 50 feet. I mean, I'd be interested in maybe exploring a minimum depth before it could even be considered. And I don't know what that is, but we saw, what, 76 today? And that looked to be pretty hard. So it's probably somewhere in that range before you should even look at it. And then I think we'd save ourselves a lot of headache by not having to look at all these strange yeah. ways that people try to scram something into 50 feet. Because that's what's going to happen. And of course, without it, the one building on the corner will just get bigger and bigger as well. Yeah, I, I don't. I think if there's going to be something big on the corner, though, sometimes that isn't. It just matters whether they did it well or not. <laughs> That's the problem. I'm not necessarily opposed, but just I want to make sure that we just don't get crowded into a corner where mm -hmm. we're we're wrestling for hours trying to get something that works here. But any other thoughts at this time? I'm curious if any of you think you may be able to attend any of the charrettes, because if we have more than one commissioner, I'll need to. I'll probably just go ahead and advertise anyway, so we don't have to worry yeah, about just, it. If you can you email it around? Yeah, yeah. send yes. a reminder. I'd like yes. to come. Yeah. But. And we will be sending it, too, to our neighborhood leaders and our council members so that they can submit it to their neighborhood newsletters and email blast, and we'll be sending it out in our newsletter, too. Okay. Okay. If there's no more, any more business? No, thank okay, you. meeting adjourned. Thank you.